Let's all stand as we begin. Some of you might want to move in so that others can find a seat there. Uh, thank you very much. Father, as we begin tonight, I ask that our hearts, our minds would be open and responsive to your truth. I pray, Lord Jesus, that this would be a night of great memories and thanksgiving for giving to us the life of Owen Plummer. Father, we look to you and we ask for your work to be done in all of our lives. And Father, as we raise our voices in song, I pray, I pray that you would fill us with more and more gratitude and glory to you, Jesus. And we thank you for this in your name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing I'll Fly Away. Let's remain standing as we do that.
Lord, through all generations, you have been our home. Before the mountains were born, before you gave birth to the earth and the world, from the beginning to end, you are God. You turn people back to dust, saying, Return to dust, you mortals. For you, a thousand years, are as a passing day, as brief as a, new, a few night hours. You sweep people away like dreams that disappear. They are like grass that springs up in the morning. In the morning it blooms and flourishes, but by evening it is dry and withered. We wither beneath your anger. We are overwhelmed by your fury. You spread out our sins before you, our secret sins, and, and you see them all. We live our lives beneath your wrath, ending our years with a groan. Seventy years are given to us. Some even lived to 80. But even the best years are filled with pain and trouble. Soon they disappear and we fly away. Who can comprehend the power of your anger? Your wrath is as awesome as the fear you deserve. Teach us to realize the brevity of life so that we may grow in wisdom. O oh Lord, come back to us. How long will you delay? Take pity on your servants. Satisfy us each morning with your unfailing love so we may sing for joy to the end of our lives. Give us gladness in proportion to our former misery. Replace the evil years with good. Let us, your servants, see you work again. Let our children see your glory. And may the Lord our God show us his approval and make our efforts successful. Yes, make our efforts successful. Lord Kramer, Jimmy, was born to the late Edna and Hilton Kramer on December 7, 1940. The second of four children, Franz, Jimmy, Cynthia, and Trevor. He grew up in Rohampton, St. James, Jamaica. He was that strong individual and leader we knew growing up, often telling his older brother and the others what to do, but was the first to defend or fight the battle for us. He was a quiet, straightforward person, did not mix words, and would tell you as it is. Franz the oldest and Jimmy were close, always planning and discussing things among themselves. As a child, I could not understand what they were always talking about. They, knowing that I was always afraid of the dog, would often tease me, and one day I planned to get them back. <laughs> Our maternal grandparents were Adele and Joseph Thorpe, who owned Thorpe Hill in Wuhanshan, where we were raised with them and our mother Edna, on Brownie, as we called her. Her sisters, Aunt Vivian, Aunt Meter, Aunt Olive, and their nine children, Franz, Jimmy, Alric, Jasin, Trevor, Audley, Basil, Junior, and Opal, and all the other relatives were at Torquil. We all did not know the difference. We were all belonging to the aunts. Our paternal grandfather, grandparents, Walter and Carly Plummer, raised eight children, and they produced several grandchildren. And this evening, they're presented by Genevieve, Winston, Yvonne, Christopher, Janet, and Claudia. We all grew up together and are close and dear to each other. Jimmy was also the idol of Papi, whom he think loved him more than any of the other grandchildren. We all spent many happy times with them all, and we enjoyed their company. They told us several stories that we really cannot tell.
tell you what was there. <laughs> One of Jimmy's boyhood friend was Buddha, Mr. Samuels. They were like brothers to the end. They maintained their friendship all the, through the years. I can remember as a child, the children would love to go to Gully with Papi. And Gully is where my grandfather planted his ground. And we would all get roast yam, cocoa, and it was the best thing for us. We would wash it down with, so, with um, coconut water. Mr. Samuels has represented the family on several occasions when we were not able and we thank him and appreciate his friendship with Jimmy and the family. Jimmy went to school in Roehampton and grew up living a humble life, but believing that he would be a success in life. He had that smile in his youth and loved the girls, and I think the girls loved him too. In his 70 plus years, he made four beautiful children, Paulette, Leroy, Bert and Camille. They are all grown up now and they found himself the head of the class with five grandchildren. Jimmy loved playing cricket and dominoes with his friends. He also loved being a mischievous one. After, having, after leaving school, he spent time with other family relatives, but had difficulty finding the footing he wanted. Then one day our father sent a telegram inviting Trevor, our youngest brother, to attend an interview at New York at State in Jamaica. Trevor was in Kingston at the time, so our mother encouraged Jimmy to pack his grip, which is a grip is a suitcase, <laughs> and attend the interview. He did and was offered the job, which became a life-changing event. He met a young lady named Miriam Reed, who captured his heart and tamed his smile, and he being his partner for, for the rest of their, his life. Jimmy was a family man and would encourage his family to get together whenever possible. And we can tell you from Miriam's family that he loved to be together with them. On my return from England, we would often talk and spend time together. My husband and I would organize friends and families, and we would go to his, his home in New York, where we would have a day of eating and drinking. I remember the last time before he migrated to the United States, my husband and I arrived at the house on Friday night to help with the preparation. On arriving, we were met at the steps of his house with a flashlight in hand and told, and he told us that the, go the damn goat had disappeared. <laughs> and he had, we had to go looking for it. It was sad because I guess the goat knew what was happening, what was going to happen to him, and so he took off. Anyway, the goat had a brother, so we were able to get, <laughs> get that goat, and we had a wonderful weekend. To Miriam, the family, thank you for all that you did to keep our brother, cousin, and friend happy. He had a hard fight, and you were there by his side. I think if you could have carried him, you would have. If you could have carried him at times, you would have. When we knew we had to give up, give in, ref you refused to. God has been good to all of us, and I'm sure that we will meet him someday again. To Camille, for standing beside your mother and helping for her through these difficult times, we thank you and applaud you on, and know that you will continue to give her the support as she, got, as she goes through this grieving. Miriam and Camille, we all mourn the loss of Jimmy and feel your pain. We thank you and your family 
and friends that stood by you during this difficult time. I have a poem from um, a cousin. Feel no guilt in laughter. He knows how much you care. Feel no sorrow in a smile that is not here to share. You cannot grieve forever. He would not want you to. He'd hope that you could carry on the way you always do. So take, talk about the good times and the way you should, you should you care. The days you spent together, all the happiness you shared. Let memories surround you. A word someone may say will suddenly recapture time and hour a day that brings him back as clearly as though he were still here and fill you with the feeling that he is always near. For if you keep those moments, you will never be apart and he will live forever locked safely within your heart. This is another short, the mighty river. There is nothing, there is now a calmness in my soul that was not there before. It is the calmness of a silent river moving full within its banks moving mighty but without a murmur, moving on towards the sea. Ah, it's such a mighty river, such a mighty river running, running softly to the sea. Amen. Uh, good evening, everyone. I uh, intend to be very brief, because, you know, many times, Jimmy, Mr. Plum, um, used to tell me, and others to, to stop the knives I've had. <laughs> so I don't want to hear that tonight. Uh, you know, it's quite a few years, I won't give you the exact figure, that um, Jimmy uh, came to this country. Uh, it was a personal relief to me, because at, at that time, I was um, his wife's uh, a chauffeur, handyman, and babysitter for Camille. So I, you can see how happy I was to, to have him around. Now, I'm not too worried about Camille. Camille can take care of herself, she can drive, and so on. And Mr. Plummer being the good uh, provider that he, he was, I made sure that he left the car for um, his wife, Miriam. <laughs> now, I must advise her not to try and use Jimmy's license. It won't work. <laughs> you know, you got to get your own. I don't intend to reassume re <laughs> the duties. <sighs> now, I'll try and share with you a few of um, the qualities, as I see, of um, Jimmy, <coughs> Mr. Plum. Now, this Mr. wasn't just a title. It was uh, an expression of endearment and deep respect. He earned that title. Um, Mr. Plummer recently decided to change his residence to be with our Heavenly Father. He was ailing for some time, but was always deeply concerned about family and friends. He was always appreciative of uh, the visits he got. I remember uh, whenever I go to visit, he would tell me exactly who was there whether it was a um, pastor, what he said, and so on. But he would keep repeating those visits. He would ask for practically all the friends that I knew, you know, always. He was worried about his home. And you know, uh, at first when he said to me that uh, his home mash up, I said, what happened? There's a flood or something? He said, no, where is Camille? Where is Miriam? I haven't seen them for a month. I said, a month, Jim? He said, that didn't sound um, right. 
But anyway, the thing is that his home was his family, not the house that he was uh, referring to. You know, um, he, he was well loved. And in return, he gave that love. You know, um, I, uh, for one, uh, the beneficiary of that love. He was always very supportive of my efforts. And uh, one of the things with uh, if, if you're doing something wrong, he wouldn't hesitate to let you know. Sometimes uh, you would think that he thinks you are deaf because he never tell you that you are wrong once. He would always say, you know, you're wrong. You're wrong. And the crescendo keeps rising. <laughs> so whatever um, audio um, problems you have, you're sure to hear. <laughs> you know, that was the Jimmy I knew. Uh, I, depend, I came to depend on him a lot. You know, I used to have uh, I used to uh, be involved in my alumni uh, association back home to help our um, kids back home in Jamaica. And he was always at the front, uh, forefront of my efforts. You know, he would, you know, at times complain. So if the next time I don't ask him, he would be upset. You know, so <laughs> when I discovered how he was, I really, you know, um, use use this um, is good um, size. During his active life, he's always supportive of family, friends, co-workers, and even you could say strangers. One of the most uh, comical um, thing I remembered about um, Jimmy, he was in his house quite relaxed on Ralph Avenue at the time. And, uh, you know, a lady came, even his pajamas and all that, so you know he was comfortable. But a lady came, rap on his door, say that she just uh, took a taxi and can't get him to pay the taxi. And, uh, you know, Jimmy, believing the story, gave her the, the tax appeal, only to realize that the collateral he got was a lie. You know, but even then, you know, he made that, um, he, he found fun in, in that, in, in uh, when he did, even when he didn't, the, the, the money wasn't returned. You know, so no matter how careful and smart we think we are, you know, there is always something to, you know, challenge us. The family, that's uh, his, his main, that's where all his effort, uh, as far as I could see, was um, focused. He was the, the ideal husband and family man. He could deal with the in-laws in, in fine fashion. You know, he, he enjoyed it. You know, a lot of people complained about the in-laws but he knew how to deal with his. I'm not gonna say much about that because they are all here tonight. <laughs> uh, Co-workers, you know, um, he used to be the chief coordinator, I think, for uh, his department there in uh, uh, Brookdale Hospital where he labored for many years. Uh, he would be, you know, organizing uh, retirement parties and other um, social events. And, you know, um, knowing him, I know it cost him um, dearly because he'd end up selling, you know, bread candies and what have you. And it, for those who do that kind of stuff, you know, when you sell somebody it, um, candies, they're coming back to you, you know, so it, it's, you know, you gotta know how to handle that kind of stuff if you don't have the resources. But he's always willing to, to share in his uh, organizing. Jimmy was a quiet, um, quiet spoken, um, a quiet speaker, a keen listener, and a very, very sympathetic um, 
person. Uh, he was a typical Jamaican. Loves fun, family, and all the other um, things. But, you know, he wasn't uh, some of the um, things that we, people associate with Jamaica. That is like the um, Bandula uh, thing and so on. Um, you know, you know there, there is a story in, in Jamaica where they claim that Jamaicans try to beat everything, you know, uh, to avoid everything, even death. So, you know, the, the famous mercenary there, the death, uh, the story was once told, you know, um, you know, Jamaica had a lot of problems uh, with crime at one stage, we probably still do. Uh, you know, um, and if you go to Jamaica, you see a lot of mansions, uh, you know, it's built so that it's not easily accessible. You know, so there's this man who had his plans, so you know the type of person he was, he built his mansion, had his security at his gate and so on. So when the mercenary Mr. Death um, came, you know, uh, at Jamaica at the time was very busy in the crime field, a lot of people, so he had a lot of work that week. So what the, the owner of the, the property did, the house did, he ex decided to exchange because he got wind that, you know, the assassin Mr. Death was coming for him. So he changed, exchanged the guard position with, and then put, him, put the, uh, the guard up at the house. Anyway, when Mr. Dent came, he, this, he, he realized that he was too tired. When you look at the, the mansion and uh, where he has to, you know, climb to get to the, the, this, this person. So, you know, he just looked at the, the man at the gate and he said, uh, you know, tell you the truth tonight, I'm tired. We can't go this up, so you better come with me because I have to give an account. You know, um, throughout his, his illness, um, Jimmy remained faithful. You know, uh, I remember he used to ask, what has happened to him? He didn't try to, to cheat, he was always um, truthful. And, uh, you know, he took his situation in stride. He would still make fun of us, you know, so it, it was so sad at times when we went to visit and realized that we had to leave him there. I remember he once said to me, you know, uh, the doctor and one of his uh, um, doctors is here tonight, Dr. Quest, who we, you know, have uh, every, all the faith in. And he said to me, Gabby, the doctor didn't want the hospital and I want to go home. I said, okay, Jim, you know, the, the time will come. Uh, you know, and he's, he's home now, he's home. I would like to leave a little thought with you, a comforting thought, I hope. And here it goes, he only takes the best. God saw that he was getting tired. A cure was not to be. So he put his arms around him and whispered, come with me. With tearful eyes, we watched him suffer and saw him fade away. Although we loved him dearly, we could not make him stay. A golden heart stopped beating. Hard working hands to rest. God broke our hearts to prove to us he only takes the best. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, God is good. In the word of his dear wife, in the words of his dear wife, Maria Long.
all things. At this time, we are going to have another scripture reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 45 to 48 by Mr. Charlton Plummer. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, came to, came, became a living being. The last Adam became a living, life-giving prophet, spirit, excuse me. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and, the, and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. Amen. Amen. At this time we'll hear another reflection from Mrs. Jennifer Grant. Thank you all for coming to help us celebrate Jimmy's life and support each other as we grieve his passing. My name is Jennifer Grant. Miriam and I have been friends since childhood. And so I met Jimmy when they were dating over 40 years ago. I'm not sure why I was chosen to give the remembrance, but I think Miriam knows that Jimmy and I shared a special bond, so I'm very much honored. Over the years, Jimmy and I developed a very special relationship. We could talk and laugh about every and anything, even when the joke was at his expense. I can recall Miriam telling me a story about Jimmy and her rushing out their home to pick up their daughter Camille at the train station. It was rather late that summer night, and with the trip being unexpected, Jimmy realized that he was low on gas. However, both Miriam and Jimmy were wearing nightgowns. <laughs> but Jimmy's was a real wee willy winky nightgown. <laughs> He was not deterred, thinking only about his wife and daughter Camille. He bravely ventured into the gas station as he was to pump and pay for the gas. You can just imagine the stir he caused, and of course the guys had a good laugh, and so did Jimmy. Jimmy was a man of, of sound character. He was a law-abiding citizen, almost to a fault except for just one speed in violation years ago. When he got done explaining to the officer his one moment of indiscretion and assessing that a strong warning would be sufficient punishment for him, the officer did just that, a strong warning. Jimmy was a generous soul. He was kind and warm, whether he was meeting you for the first time or just relaxing with relatives and or friends. He loved good company. Jimmy was not just a, Jimmy was, was not much of a drinker, but being a generous host, he always had a fully stocked bar with premium liquor for entertaining his friends. The beneficiary of the contents of his bar is in for a treat. Jimmy had a passion for figures he loved his job and spent many hours at it. Though his last job was not as challenging, he lacked the same passion and not putting in extra hours, allowing him lots of free time. At his last job, instead of figures, instead of, sorry, at the last job, food instead of figures became his passion. So the highlight of his day at work became lunchtime. Miriam, as most of us well know, is an excellent cook, and the only thing better than her food is her presentation. Miriam, being aware of the highlight of Jimmy's workday, would prepare his lunch daily. This truly was a match made in heaven because every day, his loving wife would prepare gourmet lunch, making Jimmy well-fed and the envy of everyone in the lunchroom. <laughs> Jimmy's dedication and love for his family was extraordinary, and it certainly was reciprocated. 
Camille and Miriam did an excellent job taking care of him during his long illness. When I visited Jimmy in the rehab center last year, I was very impressed as I watched Miriam's attentiveness and dedication as she lovingly administered him care. It would be remiss of me if I did not mention two dear friends of Miriam and Jimmy, of whom I witnessed give unwavering love and support during Jimmy's illness. They are Norma Pennant and Delcia McLaughlin. Norma and Delcia, you are awesome, thank you. I was fortunate to have spent a week with Miriam five days before Jimmy passed. The daily visits to the hospital were special and his sense of humor was still there. I will treasure those last days I spent with him. I will close with the saying, people die only when we forget them. If you can remember me, I will be with you always. Jimmy, I will always remember you, always. Thank you. I come into your presence, Lord. December 7, 1940, the late Hilton and Edna Plummer. He was one of four children. He received his early education at the Roehampton Primary School in St. James, where he passed the first and second year to make a local examinations. Jim was an avid lover of cricket. He represented the school and our district in local competition within the parish. After school, Jimmy worked briefly at the Lands Department in Roehampton before leaving to work at the New Yarmouth Sugar Estates in Carinan, where over the next 20 years he held various titles, including manager of the storage department. At the wedding reception in, in Milk River, Jimmy was introduced to Miriam Reed by her uncle. This introduction blossomed into a beautiful friendship, which led to 29 and a half years of blissful marriage. Jim migrated to the United States in 1985 and soon became a citizen. During his time in the U.S., he visited Jamaica often to maintain close contact with family and friends. He began his U.S. employment at Alexander's Department Store in Brooklyn in the Security Department before moving on to Brookdale Hospital from where he retired in February of 2014. He attended the Church of the Rock in Canarsie until his illness prevented his regular attendance. He will be remembered for his love for people, his affectionate smile, and his dedication to family. He is survived by loving wife Miriam Plummer, two brothers Francis and Trevor Plummer, sister Cynthia Yearwood, sons Charlton and Roy Plummer, daughters Paulette and Camille Plummer, and five grandchildren. He will be greatly missed. A lot of love has been expressed tonight, hasn't it? And uh, as I look at the message for tonight, it's about a family who had a lot of love and who had gone through a lot of emotion 
at the death of their brother. In John chapter 11, many and most of you know the story of Lazarus and the work that Christ would do in that, that uh, moment in the life of the family, Martha and Mary and their friends. And I know that the family has gone through a lot in these uh, last few uh, months and year as they have seen what will touch us all. All of us will be at this moment of death. And most of us here have church backgrounds. Most of us can remember some of the songs we sang tonight as children and enjoying them and appreciating them. And yet, there are different types of people who come out of an experience of being close to Christ. And I want to take a look tonight for a few moments. That's always a dangerous saying by a pastor, isn't it? For a few moments. John chapter 11 says, Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and his sister Martha. A man was sick. And the family understands that. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair. That's a very powerful story. And John, the Gospel of John, had been written after the Gospel of Matthew. And in Matthew, it recorded Mary bending low and bowing before the Lord and washing his feet with this ointment and drying it with her hair. And it's a powerful picture of great humility because something had touched her heart in a way that had not touched the others around her. And we're going to see that as we go through this time tonight. And the sisters sent to Christ saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. And Jesus heard it and said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And remember, as we look at the life of Christ, we realize all of it points to the reality that he is Lord. He is Savior. He was the promised one. Yes. There was no one else to look forward to. There was no one else that could take this place. And he wanted to leave no doubt. And so not only is this story a source of comfort for us, but it's also a story that continues to point to the reality that if you're looking to anyone else other than Jesus Christ, you're missing it. So he goes, it goes on. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. And after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. It was a place of danger. It was a place where the Jewish leadership was looking to try and silence Christ. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and are you going there again? And Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? Is, if anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, but he sees the light of this world. And really, he's referring to himself now. And he is saying, I am the light. I understand what's going on. And he's trying to bring that in them into that experience. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Are you stumbling because Christ is not in you, the light of the world? He might be around you. He might be something you know about. But Christ is emphasizing, unless his light of his life is at the core of your being and you're alive in him, you are going to stumble through this life. And then when death comes, that next step off into eternity is not going to be pleasant. You might say, Pastor, you sound like, you know, you, you're very serious about this gospel stuff. 
You want me to make you feel good tonight? Only Jesus Christ can do that. And if you don't know him, you'll only have a moment of relief tonight. But if he lives within you, you will have an eternity of relief. Amen. You will have an eternity of life. Christ spoke more about hell than he did about heaven. It was something to be very serious about. I talk to people out on the street, go up to them, kind of get their attention with my million dollar bill. Now I've got your attention. It's not real. I know you knew that. And I ask them, have you ever gotten a million dollar bill? And boy, they're all ears. They want it. Have you heard of the million dollar question? When you die, will you go to heaven? Where will you go? There's two places, heaven or hell. It's a serious question. And it's going to be a moment of judgment that will determine. And that moment of judgment needs to happen before you stand before him. And tonight I want to share that as I go through the types of people who live closely to Christ, who are around Christ, who are around the church, who hear the songs, experience them growing up, have a moment like this, and feel and sense a warmth that, you know what, uh, yeah, this is like what I grew up with. These things Jesus said about him being the light that is needed, not only for now, but for eternity. And after that, he said to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. And then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get... Well, however, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought he was speaking about taking a rest and sleep. And Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. I always like it when Jesus pauses and says, I, I, I got to spell this out for these guys. They just don't get it. And that was like the, the experience of their life. That was the story of their life. Not understanding Christ in so many ways. And I'm glad for your sakes, Jesus said, that I was not there, that you may believe. That you may believe. He's talking to his disciples, people who are pretty close to him. People who had seen most of his miracles. People that were in the inner circle. People that were supposed to be in the know. And he's telling them what we're going to go through is something that I'm hoping brings you to the place where you truly connect with who I am and what I've come to do and what you need from me. And Thomas said, who is called the twin? He said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Boy, that's quite a statement, isn't it? He's not connecting the dots. He's saying, it doesn't look good. There's a lot of hostility in Judea. We followed him this far. We might as well go to our death because that's where he is going. It's almost a hopelessness that was in them. Thomas was speaking for all the disciples. None of them contradicted him. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. Many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. There was a lot of love going on, and I've seen it in the family tonight, and I just love it. I just have a, a great sense of, of pleasure when I see a moment like this, and I see family loving one another. And it's not going to stop. Something that's going to continue needs to continue. And Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. And Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give to you. 
And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? And she said to him, yes, Lord. Yes, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who has come into the world. And what she is doing here when she says, who has come into the world, she's quoting back John the Baptist. Because his message, this is the one who has come into the world as the Lamb of God who is to take away the sins of the world. So she's looking back and she's saying, yes, I know who you are. But the danger is there is something blocking that from becoming personal in her life. She has an intellectual knowledge. She's grasping, I believe, more than the disciples did. But we're going to see it was not connecting in her heart and in her life. When she had said these things, she went away and secretly called Mary and saying, the teacher has come and is calling for you. And as soon as she heard that, she quickly arose and came to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose quickly and went out, followed her, saying, she is going to the tomb to weep. Just intense emotion all through this. And that's part of our experience of letting go of a loved one. There's lots of emotions. Those are God-given emotions. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now notice, she is saying the same exact thing that Martha has said. But that's all she's going to say. It's a big difference from Martha. And we'll look at that in a minute. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned and in the spirit was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. Jesus wept. The Jews said, see how he loved him? Jesus understands when you weep. Jesus understands when that emotion wells up within you and you say, you know, he's gone. They're gone. We have a great high priest who has been touched by all of our weaknesses, by all, by all of our experiences. And the Jews said, see how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind and have kept this man from dying? Jesus also groaning in himself. Just a deep ache is coming up within Christ. Came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone laid against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he's been dead for four days. Now, I want you to understand something here. Martha is the one who comes to Christ. She usually has something to say to him. But now she has a moment where she is expressing something that is saying to us, she's not really that connected to who Christ is. She had said to him, I believe you're the resurrection and the life. But now when it comes to a moment of him exercising his resurrection power, she is not connected to it. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? And they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you've always heard me and hear me. And, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, 
that they may believe that you sent me. The purpose you sent me, to take away the sins of the world, that they would connect with that truth. Now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. And then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did believed in him. Interesting, the people connected with Mary came to a place where they were able to believe in Christ on the basis of which Christ came for us to believe in. Not the disciples, not Martha, but Mary. And I want to see the attitudes, the characteristics, just for a moment around these three. I look at the disciples, and they're very sincere. Very, very sincere, but they're sincerely wrong, aren't they? All they have in their mind is, what is happening today? What is happening with my agenda? I, I'm, I'm believing that Christ is going to set up his kingdom here in Israel, and we're going to be the closest ones to him. We're going to be really, really successful. And now that seems to all be going down the drain. It just seems to be falling by the wayside. We might as well go with him. He's going to be killed. We might as well go ahead and die with Lazarus. We'll all die. There are times when I see within the church, and I hear people saying within the church, well, it's my time. I guess, okay, it's my time. And yet have not connected the dots what it means to step off into eternity. I've asked them, are you ready? If you were to die right now and stand before God, there's a judgment. That's what the scripture says. There's appointed unto man once to die, and then what? Then, then comes the judgment. What will he judge you on? He will judge you on his ten laws. You, you will go through the, the law in your mind prior to standing before in that judgment day, hopefully, and you will ask yourself, have I ever lied? I had a young man say to the, me, me this week, of course, everyone lies. I said, I'm, I'm not talking about everyone. I'm talking about you. No one else is going to be standing with you on judgment day. How about you? Yes. You're a liar. That doesn't sound like a very good person. You told me you were a good person. It's a serious moment. And... You, you come to a place of resignation, you, 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 you need to ask yourself, why am I almost apathetic? Why am I like, nah, this is life. Why don't I have a sense, and I, I spoke with Mr. Plummer. I went through the gospel with him, and he says, I want to assure you, Pastor, I, I put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want you to know that where he is right now, there is no other message he would want you to hear. He would want you, at a time of being sensitive to what we will all experience, death, do you have a confidence that when you take your last gasp, your last breath, since we have a real, alive relationship with Jesus Christ, we're going to spend eternity with, with him. And yet, that was not their, their experience at all. So I look at them and I go, you're sincere. You're, you're very sincere in following Christ. But yet, you have not yet connected the dots. And we see they didn't. Because after the crucifixion, they were in fear and trembling. They thought they had lost everything. So they needed to have an experience of surrendering to Jesus Christ through repentance and faith. And they would eventually do it. You might be very sincere, but I will tell you this, it's not going to help until you're truly connected through repentance and faith. Then I look at Martha. She misunderstood what she had heard. She heard it. She even quoted back John the Baptist. Some of you can quote scripture. 
Come, some of you knew all the songs tonight. You knew them by heart. If anyone were to ask you, do you believe in Jesus? What would come out of your mouth? Yeah, I, I believe in Jesus. Sure. I grew up in the church. Martha did too. And yet she did not understand when it came to that point of really understanding. And we, under, we, we see this in Luke chapter 10 where Martha is hosting, Martha and Mary are hosting, the Lazarus are hosting Christ. And they're having a great dinner, but Martha is running around with the serving and we see her react and say, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Here she is. She's talking again, isn't she? What's Mary doing? Mary's listening. Tell her to help me. She's even telling Christ what to do. Did you ever tell the Lord what to do? Maybe. Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed. You don't have it. That's what he was telling her. There's one thing that is needed. Implying and making very clear. You don't have it. Mary does. He says, Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. And that good part was found at the feet of Christ, where she was weeping and anointing his feet and washing her feet, his feet. And it was a... It, it was something that Martha was not in touch with at all. And now Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening and learning and just enjoying Christ, the light of the world. Martha didn't catch it at this moment. I'm sure she did after this experience in John 11. But I want you to know that you could be very, very understanding you could be very connected to the church, but not be connected to Jesus Christ in the way that he came to be connected to as Lord and Savior of your life, where he is your all. You've had a supernatural work of salvation done in your life that has transformed you. That's what, it, that's what we see in the life of Mary. I look at her and I, I see that uh, she is just confident in her relationship with him. She says the state, if you were here, he would not have died. And that's all she needs to say. She doesn't say anything else. When he says, take the stone away, she doesn't argue. She doesn't say anything. She's confident whatever he's going to do, whatever he says, it is going to work because he is the Messiah. He's the promised one. But she also knew he was the Lamb of God who was take, to take away the sins of the world. Mary, in bowing at the feet of Christ, had experienced true repentance, a change of mind. You don't bow and anoint the feet of Christ unless you have connected that he is Lord and he is Savior and I am lost and I'm wretched and I'm dead in my sin and I need a Savior. That's what she's communicating when she knelt before his feet and washed his feet and anointed them. Because Jesus says, she's doing this for my burial. She understands what I've come for. She understands. You can't understand until you see yourself for who you really are before the righteous Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. When Mary anointed the feet of Jesus, what did the disciples do? They complained. Why? Because they had greedy hearts. Judas leading them, right? Hey, this money could have been used for what? The poor. Wow, all of a sudden Judas is really getting a heart, huh? No. No. They just didn't understand, and yet they were so close to Christ. I, I don't want you to miss this night of connecting with Christ. It means 
humbling yourself in repentance, having a change of mind as you say, Lord, I've lied. Lord, I've stolen. I've had people say to me, I've never stolen anything. I said, have you ever stolen time from God? Have you ever stolen money from God? Someday you'll stand before him and look into your heart and he says, you're a thief. One of the things that gets the, the attention of the uh, tough guys out on the street, I go up to them with the million dollar bill, that automatically uh, gives me an in with them somewhat. And I share with them, I say, you know, have you ever taken the good person test? I go through the 10 laws. And I said, you know what, I just want to let you know that I'm a former murderer. They go, come on, man, you don't look like one. Oh, I'm one. Oh, yeah, I'm a former murderer. There's no doubt. I'm not lying about it. Jesus said, if you're angry in your heart with your brother, you've already committed murder. Oh, well, that's not like the other kind of murder. Really? What are you saying? Jesus, you don't know how to teach? Jesus, you really don't know what you're saying? What are you going to say? We work hard to make ourselves look really good, don't we? It's not worth it. Jesus sees into your heart. You might argue tonight and say, I don't even really believe there's a God. Well, let me tell you something. If you are wrong, it's not going to be a pleasant eternity. And I will tell you, as I look around at this universe and as I engage with people, I go, there is a creator. He owns us. We're responsible to him. And he's communicated in such a powerful, powerful way. And yet so much of the time, we're close. But no cigar, right? Not close enough. Who are you tonight? I hope and pray you're a Mary. I hope and pray you have bowed at the feet of Christ. And you have cried out and said, Jesus, forgive me. I turn from my love of sexual immorality. I turn from my love of holding grudges and bitterness. I turn from my love of lying of greed, putting you second, God. You meditate on the Ten, ten Commandments you, 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 and ask the Holy Spirit to convict you. You're going to have a real relationship with Christ. It will never end. That is the message that Mr. Plummer would want you to hear tonight. You come to death's door, life comes into perspective, doesn't it? And tonight, I, I want to say to the family, just like Martha and Mary, they were filled with love for Lazarus. Lazarus would die again. They would have to go through it again. But they knew that there was a resurrection. And I know, Miriam, that you wanted a good, clear gospel message. I know that you wanted a message that Mr. Plummer came here and heard here in the church and would want his family and friends not to be just sincere, not to be sincerely wrong, not to be Martha, who were constantly talking, talking, talking the talk, but not getting to that point where they walked in repentance and faith, but to be a Mary who truly humbled herself before the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor Ron, come and have a time of prayer with the family. Father, we thank you for what we heard tonight. We thank you for your truth. We can look to you, O oh Lord, one who stands apart from all other gods, 
You alone are God, to be worshiped and honored. You are the creator, the one who sent your son to die and to pay the penalty in our place that we can be made right before you. Lord God, once again, you've brought us to a place of understanding and acknowledging our own mortality. It's an undeniable, indisputable truth that we must all come to this place. There's a time to be born and a time to die. And Lord God, even as we are brought, are forced to think on these things even now, God, we ask that our hearts would be made right before you, that we can turn to you, understanding that you are the only solution to our sin problem. So we thank you. Lord, for those who have not made that commitment to you, even tonight, we're praying, oh Lord, that there would be conviction, that there would be trouble in the soul, oh God. For the greatest thing that can be brought forth from tonight would be a troubled soul that leads to sincere repentance and faith and trust in Jesus Christ. For then all of heaven rejoices as the angels rejoice and give glory for the salvation of another. So God, this is our prayer for tonight. For those who have come to a place of repenting of all sin, having a change of mind, being brought to hate all sin, and to love Jesus Christ, having a heart broken over the wickedness in our lives. Father, we're thankful for the work of salvation. We're thankful for what you've done. So God, even now we're asking that you would send the Holy Spirit to be a comfort. Comfort the family. May they be comforted now. Lord, even as your word says, comfort them. Surround them with believers. May they be comforted, Lord God, by believers who have understood the comfort with which you have comforted us, that we may also comfort others in times of trials and tribulations, in times of sorrow. So Lord, we're asking that your Holy Spirit would comfort Ms. Marion Plummer, Camille, the family, oh God, the friends even now, all of those who are bereaved at this time, Lord God, we're asking, we know there's hurt, we know there's pain, be a comfort as the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, God, send him to comfort us now. We thank you, O oh Lord, that we can continue to bless your name, even through all things as you give and as you take. We will say, blessed be the name of the Lord. So we thank you through and in all things. And we pray a continued prayer of comfort upon the family, even now. These things we ask in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. This time we call Miss Camille Plummer to give acknowledgments. I don't think I've ever been so nervous in my entire life. For a number of reasons. First, I would like to give my dear Father God all the thanks and praises for taking my father out of pain. I will try my best not to second guess any of the decisions that he's made, because I know ultimately it was the right decision. Try my best, because I know right now I miss my dad, because mm -hmm. he's my dad. I would like to thank all of you that took the time out of your busy schedules to come and worship and give thanks and say your goodbyes with us today. There's a number of things that you could have been doing and you chose to join us, my mom and myself, and my dad. Thank you very much. I would like to thank Pastor and the church family. You've been so kind to us, so generous so thoughtful, very inviting. All of your prayers and all of your blessings have been greatly appreciated. 
Thank you very much. To my Reed family, thank you for taking this journey with my mother and I for two and a half years. Every phone call, every text message, every visit, every email, every thought, every prayer is greatly appreciated. There isn't another family out there like mine. We're loud. We can't chat. <laughs> We're in each other's business. But it's all for love. And we could not have gotten through this without you. So my aunts and my uncle, thank you for being by our side. To Dr. Kellyan and Dr. Liverpool, thank you for taking the best care of my dad. Dr. Quest, you were touched by an angel. You treated my father like he was your own. There wasn't a moment that we thought you did not have our best interest at heart. You never, ever gave up. He said, I am going to do the best for him, and you did. You treated him like a man, you treated him with respect, and that is all I would have ever wanted for my dad. Please don't think that there's anything more you could have done. You've done way more than I would ever expect from a man. I wish there was another word that I could use, but Dr. Quest, thank you so much. My mom thanks you, my dad thanks you, and may God continue to bless you. Thank you. To the nursing team at Downstate. My mother and I were there every day. Every day. And you never turned a side eye. You always made sure to make sure we were just as comfortable as my dad was. Whether it's to offer us extra juice, to offer us some ice, an extra chair to make sure we were comfortable, to make sure dad's needs were met. If my mom was too sick or too tired to get out of her bed this morning, you would have made sure my father ate. The minute I got off that elevator at work, your dad did good today. He ate today. He didn't give us too much trouble to take his medicine today. He was calling for you today. It shows us that you cared. And I know anyone in here that has any ailing parent, friend, or family in the care of a hospital, all we want to know is that when we are not there, they are getting the love and care that we would have given them ourselves. And we got that times 10. Thank you. Delcia, 
Uncle Gabby. Thank you for making sure mom was okay. For making sure she had a ride when I couldn't give her one. For making sure she could get my dad to his treatment or to the hospital or the supermarket. Whatever the need was, you were there. Thank you. Aunt Norma, there's a reason why I put you in that seat. <laughs> now, a lot of us feel we have friends. Not many of us have true friends. My father has been sick for two and a half years. My mom has four sisters none of which live in New York. I go to work in the day, so you would think my mom would have to bear this task by herself, but she didn't. She had her sidekick, a compadre, her sister from another mother, her friend, companion, all of that in my Aunt Norma. If mom was sick, Aunt Norma would leave her house and go and sit with daddy and make sure he was okay, make sure his needs were met, make sure he just had a little bit of companionship when he needed it. How many of your friends would do the same for you? I don't ever have to worry about having proper support because I know for a fact that we do. Auntie, you didn't have to. You wasn't paid to. You wasn't forced to. Too, but you did it. Thank you very much. To my friends and my cousins, thank you for still loving me even when I shut down. For not turning your back on me when I ret didn't return the phone calls. Still believing in me when I lied to you and said I was okay. For still being there when I may have pushed you away. I didn't know how to handle it. My dad was sick. And my dad is everything to me. And I needed to be strong for my mom. And I didn't know how to share. So it was easier for me to just keep it to myself lock it away and push through. I would never told, tell you to do what I did. So don't come and pull that stunt on me tomorrow. But thank you very much for still being by my son and loving my dad and my mom as if they were your own. Thank you. Daddy. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me 
to be your child. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for teaching me how to fight like a man. Thank you for digging deep in your pockets when we went to Jamaica and I wanted some extra fish and fried dumpling or whatever else you needed I needed to eat. He wouldn't do that here. But across the water, my father would stay. Thank you, Daddy. Thank you for fighting. Thank you for eating when you didn't want to eat. Thank you for taking the medicine. Thank you for fighting. Thank you for wanting more. Thank you for trying. When you first stopped walking, you could have given up then. But you kept trying. You kept pushing. You kept at it. To the point where you was able to get behind a wheel. I don't, you know, the doctors and the nurses, they always say, Mr. Plummer is a fighter. He's a strong man. He's a true gentleman. He is. He never gave up. He was my dad. And I will never give up. Thank you, Dad. If I had done anything in life worth attention, I feel sure that I inherited the disposition from my mother. Mommy, we did good. We did. My daddy wouldn't have lasted this long if you didn't pay attention. You saw things no one else did. You saw it first. You questioned. You didn't take no for an answer. You pushed. If I have an ounce of that, I would. <laughs> I would have done good. I don't. I don't want to. I don't want you to question anything that happened before today. You and I know God is in charge. He gave us a lot of time to say, I love you, to say, we're in it with you, to fight together as a team. And we did it, Mom. I'm so grateful. that you were my mom. That you loved him the way you did. And it showed. It was his time. Now it's our time. As we move forward, we will continue to be a team. We will continue to sing God's praises. We would be continue to be grateful for the time that we had, and we will continue to love him. We will be okay. So, Mom, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Again, to 
every one of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Immediately after today's service, we will be having a repass at Caribbean Hall on 1914 Utica Avenue. We would love if you will join us and worship with us and continue to give thanks with us. Thank you. <laughs> 